Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this tutorial. So today's tutorial is on neurology, on neurological emergencies to be precise, and this is given by Sanskriti. So just a few rules, for those of you that are watching via Zoom, any questions or comments that are covered in the moment, if you just want to pop it into the chat, and any questions that can wait to the end, if you just pop it into the Q&A. If you're watching on the Facebook Live, just comment your questions or comments and we'll pass them on to the tutor. Um, that's all from me now and I'll hand over to Sanskriti. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Sanskriti. I'm a recently qualified doctor from Oxford. Um, I did my intercalation in um, neurosciences and I'm going to be doing a clinical neurosciences AFP in Cambridge. Um, and thank you for joining us. It's really hot outside. Um, you should be enjoying the sun, but you're here um, listening to me talking about neurological emergencies. So let's go. Um, so just before we start, um, a bit of a disclaimer. Um, this is a presentation made by me um, about things that I've learned and how I've learned them. This is not in any by any means a manual for what you should be doing in um, clinical medicine. Um, these are just a few pointers. I don't think I could cover the whole of neuroemergencies in detail in an hour or so. Um, but I've just given you a few kind of scaffolds to use um, in your kind of clinical neurosciences rotation if you have one like that. All right. So let's start off uh, by laying out a few learning objectives. Um, so when you talk about neurological emergencies, you need to know how to approach an emergency in the first place. So I'm going to give you a bit of an approach to that. Um, then I'm going to give you um, a few red flag questions to ask about during history taking. We are going to learn a bit about how to calculate GCS, the Glasgow Coma Score, and also an outline about the management and just the theory behind um, head injuries, sudden onset headache, meningitis and status epilepticus. Just a few select things that I've um, chosen to be um, the top kind of um, neuroemergencies. Again, as I said, this is by no means a manual for what neuroemergencies is. Um, I don't think I could possibly cover all of them um, at one go. Um, so let's talk about the ABCDE of um, emergencies. Any emergency situation, because everything is going off all at once, it's really important that you have some sort of scaffold, you have some sort of um, structure that you can um, kind of follow your management around. And that's called the ABCDE approach. I'm sure some of you have heard it already. Um, and the core of the ABCD approach is A, being airway, B, breathing, C, circulation, D, disability, and E, exposure. So they are structured in this way because they are chronologically what will kill you first. If um, you are in an emergency, let's say um, the patient's had a head injury, the first thing that would kill them is a non-patent airway. If the airway isn't working, um, that would be the first thing to kill them so that's the first thing you need to secure and so on as you go down the list. Um, with head injuries the other thing to keep in mind is the c-spine which is a cervical spine. Um, you need to make sure that that is intact um, because if you think about it the, um, the c-spine is very um, important because the spinal cord that passes through that area is obviously connecting the brain to the rest of the body so if you have a transaction or a break over there um, the likelihood is that you would paralyze everything underneath and if you remember from your um, clinical um, anatomy C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. So um, you need to make sure that all of, you know, the cervical spine is intact because if you don't have that, you might not have any of the muscles underneath working. Um, so that one's important. Um, airway is airway patency. Um, also going through the neck is the major channel that connects to the lungs. So um, another important structure, you need to make sure that that is patent so that um, the patient can breathe. Um, breathing 
talks about the lungs and if they are at the perfect kind of optimal situation to be able to um, oxygenate the blood. So if you have a pneumothorax, for instance, or a hemothorax, which is air or blood in the, uh, within the chest cavity, you would have difficulty oxygenating blood uh, compared to a person who has normal lungs, right? So that's the next thing to look after. Circulation is your general blood pressure, heart rate. If you're bleeding out and you don't have blood and your, you're just exsanguinating, um, that's another problem. You need, to, um, you need to have an intact circulation and you need to have an enough volume of blood circulating around the body so that you can oxygenate your muscles and um, all, the other org all the other vital organs, especially the brain. Um, um, so circulation is next. Disability talks about blood glucose and um, the GCS, which will come about the consciousness um, score. Um, so you need to assess that at level D. And finally, exposure talks about temperature and any rashes, any other um, gashes anywhere, like um, injuries and all of those. So those are the core things, the ABCs of emergency management. So it's not just for neuro emergencies, you can use it um, in any emergency situation. If you, if you don't know what you're doing when you're approaching a patient, use an ABCDE approach and you'll always be right. And finally, there's F and G as well. Um, F is a full history that can come from either the patient or um, a collateral historian, such as someone who's watch what's happened um, and then finally the general OBS, biochemistry, radiology and all of those investigations. There's also a H uh, but I deliberately didn't put it on there because I don't think it should come after all of these. H is for help. Um, I believe you should call for help as early as possible and it's always right to call for help. It's only wrong to call for help when it's too late um, so always, if you're in a situation where there's an emergency, always call for help. You, you can always do with more backup. All right. And also, if you have any questions as we go along um, through this, just drop them into the chat. And those of you um, who you are on Facebook, just pop it in the, in the comments and I'll have a look at that as well. OK, so that was one scaffold. The next scaffold. Um, when you're in, a, in an emergency situation, as I said, everything is going off and you need to have a structure. You need to have a structure going into it. So the next very important thing is the surgical sieve. So once you've assessed what's going wrong, you need to know why it's going wrong. And for that, you need um, a structure to come up with the variety of differentials that could be causing the pathology um, that you see in front of you. And a very good way to do that is to have a surgical sieve. And if you type into Google surgical sieve or vitamin D or um, whatever you've learned in med school, you'll find loads and loads of different acronyms, mnemonics, all sorts of things, um, how you can remember these. And this is just um, a quick thing I came up in like five minutes just to think about all the different um, neuro emergencies that could come up for each of the different um, kind of points in the surgical sieve. Um, so I use the vitamin C, D, E, F. Um, you can obviously use that. This is free for use. I didn't think this up. Um, and I just went down and thought of all the different um, emergencies I could think of in a, I don't know, in a couple of minutes for um, each of the different types. So you can see there's just a huge variety of things and we're not even going to scratch the surface of um, all of this today um, and I didn't even get to the endocrine and functional and all of that um, so I would suggest every time you approach any topic in medicine it doesn't have to be just neuro any topic in medicine just have um, let's say there's abdo pain or let's say there's headache just sit down, have your surgical sieve, and think of all the different kinds of things that could cause a headache, an abdo pain, a leg pain. And it will really help you in terms of your history taking, your examination techniques, and then kind of presenting and all sorts. So um, especially those of, those of you who are in the younger years, of younger clinical years, it's a very good skill to develop. It's a very good habit to develop. So I would highly recommend you use this. 
So on to actual neuroemergencies. Um, the first thing that comes to mind um, in neuroemergency, this is more of a neurosurgical emergency, I guess, is head injury. Um, head injury is quite obviously, I think, an emergency. And I think we should just start off with a question. Um, so you are part of the trauma team that have um, been assembled in a &E to see a 25 year old young man um, who was struck on the side of the head by a cricket ball. He was briefly knocked out, so his teammates called an ambulance because he was disoriented on arousal. What, uh, on the way um, to the hospital, he lost consciousness. So what is the immediate action that you need to do? What do you think you need to do right now once you see this young man? Put it in the comments, put it in the um, chat. Perfect, great, keep it coming. Brilliant, you guys seem to have caught on. Um, yeah, very good. So, ABCDE, ABCDE approach and call for help. Uh, one of you guys um, uh, have put on there, yeah. Um, so, ABCDE for sure, that is your first um, port of call that's what you do make sure that he is okay in all all aspects that he is able to breathe that he's able to um, keep his organs oxygenated um, if a patient is talking to you their airway is patent that's the easiest check that you can do if they're not responding always suspect that their airway is not patent okay so that's just another tip in terms of emergencies so well done and what is the differential diagnosis at the moment? In the comments? Brilliant, well done. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, so I can see a lot of extradural hemorrhages coming up. Um, so yes, so this, this sounds like an extradural hemorrhage. So extradural hemorrhage means um, that, so you have the dura, it's, a, uh, it's the thick covering of um, the brain and an extradural hemorrhage means that the bleed is outside the dura, between the skull and between the dura. So the blood can collect there and um, because it's a finite space, usually the bleed can be fairly well controlled, but it has knock-on effects on um, kind of consciousness and the level of arousal that the patient will have. So um, this is very classic. So he, a patient gets hit on the head, on the side of the head, um, at the terrian, someone um, um, said on the comments, you can look it up on Google. I think it's better than me ex trying to explain it, what the ter terrian is. It's better to see the image, I think. So if you get hit there, the middle meningeal artery is just underneath. And um, the fracture of the terrian can, um, can cause um, the middle meningeal artery to be um, cut and there would be a bleed between the skull and, between, uh, and the dura. So that's called an extradural hemorrhage. And it's very classically presents with um, with someone being hit on the side of the head, being knocked out, and then he wakes up again, and then there's a loss of consciousness again, so that there's a bit of an up and down. So very well done to everyone who said extradural hemorrhage. Um, there we go, so trauma at the terrian, EDH mo most likely. So at this, mo at this point, if you were in an actual hospital, People would, um, the team would already have suspected some sort of traumatic brain injury. So they would most likely have already called for help while you're doing the ABCDE. The thing is, while I say that ABCD is, uh, e is a linear approach, it usually isn't. That you have three or four um, teammates um, in your kind of emergency team and everyone's attacking from every end. So um, yeah, so you refer to neurosurgeons, they'll probably sort it out. Okay, so a bit more. Um, the accompanying teammate tells you that the man was hit just above the left ear with a ball. 
and some other boyish comments. Um, they had been chatting normally um, in the ambulance, but became increasingly slurred and then drowsy. He's usually fit and well. He doesn't take any medications and the paramedic tells you that he has no midline C-spine tenderness. So this is one of the aspects of being able to assess if a C-spine is intact. So if there is any midline C-spine tenderness and if they can move um, uh, and if there is pain on movement of the C-spine, then it usually means that something's going wrong. But here he doesn't have midline C-spine tenderness and he probably can move his head around okay. So we're, we're, we're fairly okay about the C-spine, so we can, we can worry a little bit less about it. So um, we're going to try and assess his GCS. Um, he doesn't have any eye opening, no verbal response. He's flexing normally to pain on the left, uh, but no response on the right. Does anyone, um, everyone want to try and work out his GCS? Okay, I'm getting a few answers. Any more? Okay, I've got a few threes, a few fives, fours, sixes. Keep going, a couple more, and then we'll work it out. Six and a three. Okay, so a GCS of three means someone is dead. Um, a dead person has the GCS of three. Um, so let's go on to actually working it out. Oops. Oh, I seem to have messed up the slides, but that's okay. So. Glasgow, um, Glasgow Coma Scale. This is um, the manual for GCS. So eye opening, if there's no response, then it's a one. If it's the best verbal response, if there's no response, then it's one. And motor, if there's no response, it's one. So a person is most likely very dead um, if you have a GCS of three. So if they have no eye opening, no verbal response, and pain, localizing to pain on the left and abnormal flexion on the right. Given this scale on this side, can you figure out what, what the GCS is now? Put it in the comments for me. Fives and sixes. Lots of fives and sixes. Okay, let's see. So whenever someone asks you to um, figure out the GCS, you should always um, think about give, um, giving the breakdown of it. Um, if, a, if a neurologist or a neurosurgeon comes to you and you say the um, GCS is five, they don't know what um, the different like eye movement responses and the verbal responses. So it's always good to break it down. So that's the first tip. So let's work through this. So he's got no eye opening. So on the um, first category, he would get an E1 because there's no response. In the verbal thing, he doesn't have a response again. So again, he would get a one. And the best motor response, so he's localizing to pain on the left, but has abnormal flexion on the right. So the best out of the two is the localizing to um, pain. So that would give him a five. So you have to keep, um, because he has um, a bit of variability on the left and right, you can give him a five, but you'd be very wary of um, kind of giving him the entire mark. So you, you can um, reassess it at a later point. You can give him the five now and then reassess at a later point. So that tots up to a seven. All right, does that, does that make sense to any, uh, every, everyone? If there's any questions, I can answer them now. No questions, all good? Yeah, okay, great. So I have a few others that we can try. So, um, another case here. So why don't you all have a go again? So I have a question for why does he get a four for abnormal flexion? 
Um, yes, you're right, actually. Um, he would get a three, wouldn't he? Yeah, you're right. Okay, so I'm getting answers for the next one. Deep central pain stimulus. Okay, any more answers? Well done, everyone's breaking it down. Great. Okay, all right, so let's go through it. I've got plenty of answers. So E1, V1, M5. Um, let's see. So he's got deep, uh, on deep central pain stimulus, the patient bends both his arms towards the chest. So he's moving and localizing to pain. So a central pain um, stimulus is rubbing against the sternum so if you all try um, be gentle because it, it, it does hurt so if you try and press against your sternum right now it, it is quite painful it is really uncomfortable and if someone is laying in the anatomical position which is essentially just laying out on the on on the floor or the bed with their arms down um, that is localizing to pain if they're bringing them towards their chest Okay, so a couple of learning points here. So deep central pain stimulus is a sternal rub. Um, and if they're coming towards that, then um, it's localization to pain. Okay. Um, and no other response. You're all right. E1, V1. Okay. Is that all okay for everyone? Any questions here? Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Last example. So, um, isn't decorticate position arms bent towards the chest? I'll answer that just in, uh, in just a minute. I'll just let. Um, people answer um, the question. Okay, lots of answers. So Going back to the decorticate position um, question, it's um, it's very characteristic. It looks very um, different to anything you've seen. So if you type it into um, Google Images, it's almost um, it kind of looks like a tonic clonic seizure kind of um, position, you know, it, and the arms are bent inwards and they are towards the chest, but it's very, um, it looks like someone's clutching onto something really hard. Um, I would, yes, I, I agree that the, um, that the description I've given here is very vague, very vague um, and it's not clear. Um, but I think over here, what I was trying to get at is that he is kind of pointing or localizing to the chest where the sternal rub is happening. I hope that answers the question slightly. Um, um, okay, so the next one, I'm getting lots of answers. 11, um, GCS 11, E2, V4, M6 um, is a lot of the answers okay let's have a look so e2 v3 m6 yeah so um he only opens eyes on sternal rub again so this is the pain stimulus so he gets a two for that um only says the word exams when you ask um questions or give pain stimulus so um i would say that is inappropriate 
um, and then squeezes your hand when you ask them. So he is, um, he or she, the patient is obviously obeying the the commands that you're giving um, for them to do. Okay, brilliant. Is everyone fairly confident about how GCS works? Any more questions about GCS? No? Yes, okay. So I seem to have messed up the slides um, a little bit, but let's go back to um, the various kinds of um, head injury. Um, there seem to be a few questions on Q&A. Let's have a look. Uh, what does it mean by abnormal flexion? So abnormal flexion is what I was talking about um, earlier, um, the decorticate position. Um, so it's like someone's clutching onto um, something, your art, hands are turned inwards. You can, um, you, as I said, you can, again, look it up on Google Images. Google is your best friend in medicine, really. Um, and it, it's a very, it's flexing all of your mus muscles at the same time. And it looks quite um, difficult to do. So if you do it, if you flex your bicep, flex your forearm, flex at every joint, um, that's what decorticate positioning looks like. Can you explain how we get unequal pupils? Okay, we can do that um, uh, at the end, if that's okay. Um, and is there any easy way to remember GCS and what each number means? Sadly, no. Um, I think you um, have to just kind of learn it. But I think the more questions you do, the better you remember it. Um, so just every time you see a neuro question, um, just do just do a GCS, um, a head trauma question or something like that. Um, there's plenty of examples online and there's plenty of multiple choice questions. I'm pretty sure all of you have PassMed or something like that. There's plenty of questions on there. Um, so just, just practice it um, and It'll, it'll come to you naturally. I think I think I found the um, so if we go back to um, this slide, I, I think I found the best motor response, the most difficult. Um, the eye opening and verbal response almost kind of follow the same pattern. Um, and the the best motor response would confuse me. So it will take a bit of time, but um, you'll just get it over, um, over practicing. All right, so let's go back to the different um, types of head injury. The, the main thing about managing head injury is that you want to prevent secondary brain injury. So the primary insult is when, you, um, when the patient gets hit on the head, when, or when there's a fracture or when there's um, the initial bleed. The secondary brain injury is what that that initial insult causes afterwards. So um, a bleed may compress on the brain and it could cause ischemia, it could cause um, raised intracranial pressure, it could cause other bleeds later on. So, or, and, um, it, so essentially what you want to do is prevent an injury from progressing from the initial insult. So um, I thought we should also learn the different types of brain bleeds. You've all um, noted, uh, you, you all got it correctly, uh, the extradural hematoma from the case we just did, um, which is the lemon-shaped, um, the lemon-shaped bleed, essentially. It looks like a lens, it's called lenticular um, in formal speak. And then you've got the subdural hematoma, which is like the crescenteric um, bleed. So you can see here, it looks like a crescent. Um, and you can also see here, the ventricle has collapsed. Yes. Um, and that is that can cause a secondary brain injury afterwards. And finally, this is an intraparenchymal bleed, which means there's a bleed within the matter of the brain itself. Okay, all clear? All right, so the reason why preventing secondary brain injury is so important is it goes along the lines of the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. I'm, um, I'm sure um, so many of you have um, 
Uh, I'm sure loads of you know what this means. So the Mario Kelly doctrine is that the skull itself in an adult is a fixed space and it contains the brain, the CSF, and uh, the blood. So if any of these change in terms of their volume or their size in, in terms of the brain, um, it can cause a problem. So increase in volume of any of these factors can cause an increase in intracranial pressures and it can cause um, uh, ischemia. And that is something we want to prevent. So as you can see from this graph here, as the intracranial volume increases, there, there is about, uh, there's a critical volume after which a small increase in volume causes a large increase in intracranial pressure. So you want to prevent it ever getting past the critical volume. You want to keep it lower than that and in fact treat it if you can. Okay, I have a question about, can an intraparenchymal bleed be caused by an aneurysm? Um, Intracranial, intra, intraparenchymal bleeds are usually caused by um, vascular malformations, so, um, um, and also traumatic brain injury, of course. So vascular malformations are um, kind of knots of vessels that haven't formed properly, and they tend to bleed a lot. So you can get them in um, hemangiomas and uh, things like that, like a bundle of vessels. Um, and you can also get them in traumatic brain injuries. Um, and aneurysm um, is, I think, less likely to cause uh, um, a intraparenchymal bleed. Um, it isn't the same as a subarachnoid bleed, to answer another question. A subarachnoid bleed means the, the blood is pulled under the, um, the arachnoid membrane. It's not within the matter of the brain, it's surrounding the matter of the brain. It's very close to it, um, but it's not quite inside the matter of the brain. Okay. Okay, I think we have a few more questions. Can EDH and SDH occur simultaneously? Um, yeah, they would be very unlucky to have it. Um, but yeah, of course, they, they can happen um, simultaneously. There is um, a thinking that they're um, caused by two different kind of um, sizes of impact. So extra jewels um, are caused by um, kind of um, smaller impact compared to subdurals. Um, but I'm not sure if that is the actual you know, um, if that's a rule at all. Um, of course, if you have complex trauma, um, it, can, um, it can cause both at the same time. The patient would be very unlucky, um, to be honest. Um, what is the difference between an intracerebral bleed and an intraparenchymal bleed? So intracerebral means um, anywhere in the cerebrum. Um, well, yeah, I, I guess intracerebral and interparenchymal are kind of close together. Interparenchymal means in the matter of the brain. I guess intracerebral means the same. I think what you um, what the di main difference is in an intracranial bleed is different. So intracranial bleed would um, encompass EDH, SDH, and interparenchymal, whereas interparenchymal um, and intracerebral, I guess, are kind of similar. Um, maybe even used interchangeably. Um, and sorry, can you repeat what you said about intraparenchymal bleeds? So um, I said that intraparenchymal bleeds are not the same as subarachnoid bleeds. Um, I said subarachnoid bleeds are around the matter of the brain, whereas intraparenchymal are within the matter of the brain. Um, they're usually um, caused by um, kind of vascular malformations or traumatic brain injury. I think those are the main points I said for those two. Okay, let's move on. We've done this. Okay, so let's talk about sudden onset headache. Um, also, I should mention that there, there is a slide in here that talks about 
CT indications, so when you should send a patient for um, a computer tomography scan of the head. Um, and I've hidden that slide, but I think you get these slides at the end, so you, you, can, um, you can just access them then and have a look at it. Um, okay, so let's move on to sudden onset headache. So here I'll be talking about how to come up with differentials for um, headaches and um, also a, a, a bit about the management of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, so um, there's a lot of differentials for, um, for sudden onset headache. Um, the thing to note for all of these is that if, if you go down the list, most of them look vascular. So when you're asking a history, make sure to ask about cardiovascular history and cardiovascular risk factors. So this is where your different subjects in med school overlap. So you remember what you asked for heart attacks and things like that. You can ask those same things here about smoking, about previous heart attacks, previous strokes and all that stuff. Um, and finally, for subarachnoid hemorrhage, the thing you need to remember is to talk about, um, to ask about neck stiffness, um, and that's due to the meningeal irritation. So when the blood is outside the brain, it can irritate the coverings of the brain, and that gives you um, neck stiffness. Um, because every time you move, the dura moves as well. So you're essentially irritating it more by moving it around. And I guess where that's important is that you get neck stiffness with subrax and also with meningitis. So anything can really, anything odd can irritate the, the dura. So blood is not meant to be close to the dura. Um, so that's why it gets irritated. Infection or um, bacteria. Um, that's not meant to be around the dura. So again, it gets irritated and causes you neck stiffness. All right. Okay, so um, this is a very common thing. So you often get patients in ED that come in with a sudden onset headache and you have to differentiate if they're going to go to neurosurgery or if you're just going to give them some pain relief and you're going to send them home. So this is something one of my seniors taught me uh, when I was in fourth year and it stayed with me ever since. So I'm going to teach it to you guys. Um, so a few mnemonics to remember the classical features of subarachnoid hemorrhage and migraine. And subarachnoid hemorrhage is some, so it is sudden. It's unlike any other headache. It's the worst headache they've had in their entire life. It's like someone hit their head um, with a baseball bat, okay? And it's maximal at onset. The zenith is at the start. So zenith is the, the peak of the pain and it's maximal at the start and it kind of goes down at, um, later on. So they might say it was 10 out of 10. It might be 12 out of 10 at the start and then it goes down a little bit. Um, whereas for migraine, the headache is often pounding. Its onset is usually over the past two to 72 hours. Um, with subarachnoid, most people know exactly what they were doing when it came on. With a migraine, it can creep up on you slowly. Like um, it, it can, you can get kind of symptoms that give you an indication that there will be a migraine, but subarach is like someone whacks you around the head, okay? Migraines are usually unilateral, um, usually associated with nausea, and they're quite disabling. They, um, they don't allow you to do your day-to-day -day kind of tasks. Okay, any questions so far? No questions, okay. 95% um, of the time, if this is all true, if the pound um, bit is all true, it's, um, it's, it's a bad migraine, okay? And if you're worried about um, the fact that it might be an SAH, then you need to send for a CT. The CT will show you if there is, um, if it might be um, a, a subarachnoid, um, okay? We'll, we'll come on to the management later on. So I have a case here 
you don't have to read everything, but um, read the bits in red and also know that he was a heavy smoker for 40 years. So 68 year old man, worst headache of his life, severe diffuse atherosclerosis. So he has a cardiac, um, a cardiovascular history. He's had multiple bypass operations. He was a heavy smoker um, and he's had an explosive headache worse than anything he's ever experienced, okay? Um, all right, so what do we think? What's the immediate action needed? Perfect, great answers. So A, B, C, D, E, perfect, and urgent C, T, good, and escalate to senior, perfect. Great, call for help. Everyone's calling for help. I've done it, then my job here is done. Great, yes, pain relief, well done. Um, it's very underestimated, and people often forget it in an emergency. Everyone, Anyone who's in pain, I think should be allowed to get painkillers. Um, and he might be going into surgery or he might be going into resus or to neurology. But I think in the interim, pain relief is very um, important. Very, very well done. Um, he doesn't have nausea and vomiting. So um, I wouldn't really think of antiemetics, but definitely if he had a bit of nausea going on, um, then I would definitely think about it. And he's got the nuchal rigidity, which means um, that's the neck rigidity we're talking about. Okay, so all great answers. Well done. C, A, B, C, D, E. That's the one I put down. Okay, so um, for subarachnoid hemorrhage, you make the diagnosis usually on a CT scan. So you can see the star sign. Um, I hope you all can see it. So it looks a bit like a starfish. Um, that's the blood that's pulled in the um, subarachnoid region, okay? The, the white bits that shape like a star. And if there isn't that star sign initially, and if the radiologist can't see it, then you do um, an LP, a lumbar puncture, at 12 hours, okay? And in that LP results, you're looking for xanthochromia. Does anyone know what xanthochromia means? Put it in the comments. Yeah, exactly. So it is the breakdown of <laughs> blood. Um, it is the breakdown of red blood cells. Um, exactly. Um, a, um, so that's what you're looking for, the, the fragments of the, the cells um, on the lumbar puncture. And in terms of management, if you, if you're worried about it, then definitely get a neurosurgical referral, um, get them, explain the case to them and see if they think it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. They, they've seen a lot of them. So recently, for example, I had a patient exactly like this came in with a bit of a sudden onset headache. Um, you don't, you, you're pretty sure it's a migraine, but then you don't want to make the mistake of sending them home and it turns out to be a bleed, an intracranial bleed. So um, what you can do is just call up the uh, neurosurgeons and explain the case to them. And they've seen the most of these kinds of cases, so um, they can tell you what's going on. What would we do in the interim if CT is negative SAH initially and need LP at 12 hours? So you, you would acutely manage the patient. So if they've come in with nausea, you'd manage the nausea. Um, you want to uh, decrease um, vasospasm. So as I uh, have put down here, you would give them nemodipine. Um, so vasospasm is, as I said, blood is not meant to be outside blood vessels. And when it is in the brain, it causes um, the blood vessels to spasm. So they become smaller and that could cause ischemia. So to prevent that, we give them a calcium channel blocker and nemodipine, which acts specifically on the brain vasculature and doesn't work on the heart. So it's ideal. Um, so you do you do the rest of the management essentially you um, refer to the neurosurgeons and um, you do regular observations and um, and then give them nemodipine and manage anything else that they've come in with such as the pain or such as the nausea and whatever else
Bit of a side question, what is the youngest patient you have seen with a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Unfortunately, I haven't done a um, neurosurgical placement yet. It comes up in my second year of um, foundation um, of AFP. So if we have another session, I will let you know. Um, but um, I guess you meant more about the epidemiology. Um, so the epidemiology for SAH is interesting. It has um, two curves. Um, it um, affects women and men at different peaks. There's two different peaks. So women tend to get affected early on, I believe, and then men at a later age or flipped of that. Um, I'll have to check and I'll let you know. I'll put it in the, in the comments of the slides if that's easier. I'll, I'll add a link to a paper. Okay, let's move on to infection. Okay, any questions so far from anything I've said? No, all right, okay. So let's start off with a question as always. So we have a 28 year old man who was brought into A&E with one day of worsening headache, fever, confusion and stiff neck. So what are the main differentials? Use your surgical sieve. Perfect, I've got one already, speedy. Yep, keep going. Okay, meningitis, encephalitis, migraine, drugs. Perfect, I'm getting proper differentials here. Good. Great, okay. So these are the ones I um, came up with. So um, someone said trauma. Um, yeah, it could, it could definitely be trauma causing this. Um, but we have no history of it. I would definitely ask about it in the history. Well done, you're thinking ahead. Um, I think most of the things I've got are meningitis and encephalitis. So these are the main um, differentials that I came up with. Meningitis would be top of my list. He's come in with kind of infectious looking case. He's got a fever, he's got a worsening headache. He's got the stiff neck, which again, as I said before, in, infection is not meant to be there. It's not meant to be in the brain. And when it is there, it irritates the meninges, the coverings of the brain. And every time you move your, um, your neck, it, it hurts. So because the body intrinsically doesn't want to do something that hurts, you get the stiff neck, so you don't want to move it, okay? Encephalitis, the confusion could be, um, because he's got the altered kind of neurology, it could be the first signs of an encephalitis setting in. So I think of encephalitis in very simple terms, and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't um, explain it in an exam like this, but I think of encephalitis as something that is meningitis plus. So you've got um, something that is causing, um, well, something that something that's irritating the brain and therefore you have kind of behavioral change um okay and it could be sepsis so you have to sepsis uh i'm sure you've all heard uh, because it's been a huge campaign sepsis um is an infection that's blood-borne and um it's very important that we treat it very early on so always when anyone comes in with an infection you have to check that it's not sepsis sepsis is something where you're you're in circulatory shock um and you have an infection on top so um you have to treat that as an urgent urgent case okay and yes, someone said trauma, um, and I think someone else also said um, it could be a bleed. Um, so yeah, it, it could be a bleed with a stiff neck. The fever could just be something else, um, or a red herring. So you, you have to think about all of these when a patient, a real world patient comes into the hospital. Um, if this came on, to a, um, came on an SBA question at med school, I would be like, yes, this is meningitis, this is, or it could be encephalitis. But if this patient came into hospital, I would be thinking about this and a lot more, all these differentials and a lot more, okay? 
is the stiff neck, the Brzezinski um, skine, uh, sign. Um, Brzezinski skine, uh, sorry, I, I can't even say it. Brzezinski um, sign is, um, it, it may occur, yeah, it is basically the neck stiffness. All right. Okay, so again, this is a huge um, case, but um, let's go through it. So this is a previously healthy chap. He had chills and body aches. He was breathing quickly, had nausea and vomiting. He felt be better later. He had a midfrontal headache, photophobia, stiff neck with a temperature of 38.8. Took some par paracetamol and went to a party that evening. He appeared confused and was saying random words. Um, and his girlfriend then brought him to the hospital in a taxi. He doesn't seem to have very much going on in his past medical history, no travel, no contacts. Um, but he, in his examination findings, there's a lot of um, stuff going on, like his temperature's high, his respirator is a bit high, his pulse is high, his blood pressure's um, okay, it's remaining in the kind of normal regions, but you would be concerned that this might drop and it might be a shock kind of scenario, okay? He's got the nuchal rigidity, the neck stiffness. He's got the rash, um, so characteristic of meningitis. He's lethargic but rousable, and he can't he can't do simple kind of word tasks. So, what's the impression at the moment? What what are you worried about in this guy? Yeah. Yeah, meningococcal sepsis is definitely top of my list. Any anything else? Baddies in the brain, absolutely. Okay, so of course I'm I'm worried about meningitis. He's got the chills and the body aches, and he's breathing quickly. He's got the nausea and vomiting, headache, all, all of these things. So these are the things I've listed that make me think of meningitis. The um the infection in the brain and things that make me worried about encephalitis is um the confusion and the, the fact that he can't you know speak coherently in full sentences so that's making me think of encephalitis and finally i have to notify the public health of um, public health england about the fact that he's um he's got meningitis it's a notifiable disease so the girlfriend brought him um, to hospital in a taxi that was after symptom onset but even before that if we go um oops if we go back to this he went to a party the evening before he might not have been symptomatic but still you know infectious so we have to think about um notifying it um and also think about like who we cover in terms of um you know, contact um, tracing and things like that. Okay, all good so far? No questions? All right. Okay, so let's move on. So um, for meningitis, what kind of tests do you want? You want a CT brain, uh, a CT head. So the CT head will show you enhancement of the um, meninges. So you will see um it's very difficult to see at the younger clinical years i think the more you more cts you see the more you'll see the difference between what is enhancing and what's not so i would like to plug a particular website here it's called radiopedia um go on there and look up uh, all the different um kinds of radiology related to head and look up um what meningitis looks like on ct and you see just this tiny sliver of um the meninges kind of lighting up slightly um, and that's called meningeal enhancement um, then you do a lumbar puncture you always want to do a ct before a lumbar puncture because you want to look um for any signs of raised intracranial pressure um, okay, and if there's a raised intracranial pressure and you put a needle at the bottom of the spine to take some fluid out, do you know what might happen? Any guesses? Yeah, perfect. Herniation. The, the brain will just swoop out of the, um, of the skull. 
um and that that is not good you um if, if we do that then we create more damage than um any benefit to the patient so always ct before lp um there is more there is a move towards not doing ct if there's no overt clinical signs of um raised intracranial pressure at the moment um but I, I would go by what your trust guidelines are and most likely they're going to be do a ct before lp okay here I've included a table of what the LP results might be with different types of um, brain infection. So if it's bacterial, the pressure is going to be high, higher than normal. The appearance is going to be a bit cloudy. I think of it as um, kind of like bugs in the CSF. So it will look nasty, right? It's kind of like pus in a way. Pus is basically neutrophils that are dead after fighting bacteria so it will look turbid because um, the infection fighters of our bodies are trying to get rid of these bacteria so um, yeah it'll look turbid um, the protein is um, high because of breakdown of all these cells and things the glucose will be low i think of it as the bacteria um, need glucose to survive so they've been eating up the glucose in the csf so the glucose is lower than normal the gram stain um, is positive in 60 to 90 percent of patients. Um, the glucose ratio is another thing that's important. So that would be low. Again, as I said, in the CSF, the bacteria are consuming the glucose. Therefore, um, it will be lower than in the serum, as in from your blood. And the white cell count will be high because um, the white cells are trying to combat the bacteria information, uh, infection, okay? And most of them will be neutrophils, as you guys already know. In terms of viral, um, the pressure would probably be normal uh, to mildly increased. It would be fairly clear. Um, and the glucose would be normal. The gram stain, gram stain will be normal, obviously, because um, there's no bacteria to gram stain. Um, and um, the rest of it is fairly self-explanatory, I think. The fungal NTB, you can go through it in your own time. Um, it, you'll find all sorts of weird stuff there. It's kind of a mix between bacteria and viral. So if you understand the bacteria and viral well, you can go on to the fungal TB and understand those as well. And in terms of management, you have to give them antibiotics, stat. You cover for virals, so most trusts would want you to give antivirals as well. Um, if the patient is in shock, such as in sepsis, um, then you want to fluid resuscitate them. Um, you want to think about covering the contacts and notifying the disease to, um, to Public Health England. Okay, all good? Any questions? No. Okay, so finally, just a quick whiz through status. Um, so what is status epilepticus? Does anyone know? Just put it in the comments. Yeah, great. Emergency, it is, I agree. Yeah, so prolonged seizure, recurrent seizure. Yeah, so status epilepticus is a seizure which continues for longer than five minutes or multiple shorter seizures occur with incomplete recovery between them. So you're all correct, it is a prolonged seizure and it can be recurrent seizures when they occur close enough um, that there's no recovery in between them. So the person hasn't come out of the kind of sluggish post ictal phase which um, in which they look really confused and really kind of drowsy, that sort of thing, okay? And there's also refractory um, status epilepticus, which is persistent seizures despite two adequate doses of the anticonvulsants that we're going to talk about, okay? Um, and in terms of causes, I've put them, uh, I've put a breakdown in the notes. So when you get the slides, you can go over them, but essentially use your surgical sieve so um, it could be, let's start, for example, iatrogenic. It could be because of um, certain drugs that a person is not tolerant to. It could be because we've given them drugs that lower down the seizure threshold and therefore cause them seizures. 
Um, it could be because of drug overdose. It could be because of drug withdrawal. So just, be, just in that category for drugs, uh, you can come up with two or three different kinds of things that could have happened, okay? It could be because of infections, metabolic derangements, and all, all of that. So use your, use your surgical sieve. Um, and you can come up with loads of differentials for um, seizures and status epilepticus. In terms of investigations, you want a thorough blood, full blood panel, essentially. You want to know if there's any metabolic disturbances or electrolyte disturbances that you can fix very easily. You can fix glucose very easily. You can fix magnesium and calcium and all of those very easily. So you need to do all of these. You need to do your cultures and you need to do your toxicology because again if, if it's a particular drug um, or overdose that's causing it usually you can you, you can treat it you can manage it really well so it's very important to do that ecg and finally if they haven't had um, a brain scan before you want to do a brain scan because it could be something if they're in the right demographic and the case sounds right enough it could be because of a, um, a cancer in the brain, okay? And finally, as I said, causes use your surgical SIP investigations, I've said there, and the features um, usually um, you're looking for in the history taking is that they could be witnessed or unwitnessed. So if they're witnessed, you definitely want a collateral history. You want a good description of what was happening. If they're unwitnessed, it's a bit more difficult and if it is unwitnessed, there are signs in, um, within the patient that you can look at, such as a rise in lactate. Because they're flexing and using their muscles so much, um, it increases the amount of lactate. So they've got a bit of a lactic acidosis. So when you do your BBG, you can tell if there's a rise in lactate. Um, they are usually very confused afterwards, or they have this post phase of kind of feeling very drowsy, disoriented. So that's something else you'd look for. Um, tongue biting is pretty much a sure shot that this person has been seizing. I don't think we could, um, we could bite down on our tongues knowing full well that it will cause big bruising and a huge swollen tongue. And it also comes into play when you're thinking about the patient's airway. A big swollen tongue can occlude the airway so that's where your ABCD approach is very, very important. Okay. I've talked about the postictal period already. Injuries are very common. Again, recently I um, had a patient who's, who'd had it, two seizures in the past couple of days and he was covered in bruises just because he was thrashing about so much. He'd bitten the side of his tongue, so it was very, very swollen. Um, so these are all that uh, all things that convinced me that this was actually a seizure, that this was something, um, you know, to be looked further into. There are also non-epileptic seizures, but I won't go into that here. Um, if you're interested, you can um, look those up as well, or you can contact me and we can chat about it. So, um, I, I have put these in um, for when you go through the CT slides, so you can go through them um, in your own time. Oops. Um, okay, so shall we go through um, these scans again? What, what's the first one? Yep, perfect. Extra dural, perfect. Middle one. Subdural, perfect. And what were the two um, shapes that I talked about for extradural? What, what was the shape of the bleed called? Lemon, yeah, lemon, lenticular. Yeah, so I'll type it in. Uh, it's called a lenticular shape because it looks like a lens, okay? And for SDH, exactly. You, <laughs> I didn't even ask the question. It is a, cre a crescent, yeah. Um, and then finally, what's the last one? Interparenchymal. Great. Perfect. Great. Well done. Okay. So quick fire questions. What are the characteristics, uh, characteristic features from the history of someone presenting with SAH? Some. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Can you expand on the sum? Yep. Sudden. 
Worse at the beginning, that's the, that's the M. What's the U? Unlike any other pain, perfect. So it's sudden, it's unlike any other headache, and it's maximal at the onset. And anyone want to go through pound? Pounding, yep. Yeah. Onset two to seventy four hours. Perfect. Well done. Perfect. Great. Great. Well done, guys. And then finally, I've included an, another another check for the different LP um, um, findings, but we will. I'll leave that to you to go over. And then finally, takeaway messages. So I feel like I've given you a good scaffold for emergency management. So A, B, C, D, E, always. Um, and GCS calculation, unfortunately, it is something that you'll get with experience. And um, it's not something I can give you tips and tricks about um, what, how to remember it. It's just rote learning, unfortunately. Um, Monroe Kelly Doctrine, the brain is a confined space. So the, what were the three things that, um, the three main things in the brain? Anyone want to have a go at telling me? The brain, yes. CSF and blood, perfect. So those are the three things that are within the skull. Sorry, I said brain. Um, those are the three things that are in the um, skull and the change in volume of any of these can cause a problem, okay? So um, because the skull is a fixed space, in kids, um, when their um, sutures haven't, um, when they still have the soft spot and their cran um, the cranial sutures haven't fused yet, they have the ability to expand, okay? The skulls have the ability to expand and that's why if someone has a hydrocephalus um, when they're an infant, their brain, their, their head can actually get a big bit bigger. And the problem comes when the sutures obviously fuse later on, okay? With adults, our sutures have already fused. Um, we don't have a soft spot anymore. So that's why it's, it's a confined space. It's like you're trying to squeeze more things into a box that, that can't change shape or that can't change shape um, size. So um, that becomes a problem, okay? Um, great, and then um, the main aim of neurological emergencies is to stabilize um, and to prevent secondary injury. So you want to do your ABCDE so that you can stabilize the person and then you want to prevent any ischemic damage or hemorrhagic damage later on. To, you want to prevent secondary um, injury to the brain. Generating neurological differentials, use a surgical skiv, um, sieve, have a scaffold. It's always better that way because you know that you're not missing something, okay? So have vitamin C, D, E, F, or something of the sort in your brain so that when you, when it comes to thinking of a differential, you can always have something to fall back on if you've forgotten something, okay? And meningitis is a notifiable disease, all right? So someone's asked me to go on um, to the CT head indication slide. So I will go back. to that okay so there are a few um indications where you have to get an urgent ct an immediate ct within one hour okay and there are certain indications where it's okay to have it within eight hours okay so obviously you want to check that you haven't missed any of the one hour um indications so anyone who comes in with a GCS less than 13, who steps into the hospital with a GCS less than 13, who has a GCS less than 15 at two hours since the injury, an open or depressed skull fracture, any sign of basal skull fracture. Does anyone know the signs of basal skull fracture? It might be to, yeah, raccoon eyes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so it's called periorbital ecchymosis. 
So that's the um, panda eyes. Uh, post auricular ecchymosis, which is the battle sign. So behind the ears, you'll get a bit of bruising. CSF otorhinorrhea. So if you have any, um, so someone said rhinorrhea, if you have CSF dripping out of your nose, and um, how do you tell between a drippy nose and a CSF drippy nose is there is a test. Um, there is a test that detects something um, within the CSF um, that can tell you if what's coming out of the nose is just snot or CSF. Mm, and then hematympanum, so um, blood behind the tympanic membrane. Okay, I think collectively you, you, you guys came up with everything and all of these are in the slide that was hidden in the PowerPoint so you can look back at it. Okay, a post-traumatic seizure, so a seizure that happened after the trauma, self-explanatory, a focal neurological deficit or more than one episode of vomiting after the injury. So these are all indications that you need a CT head scan within one hour. These are very worth memorizing. And then there are CT head scans that you can um, do within eight hours. So um, for patients who have loss of consciousness or amnesia and any of the following risk factors, so age 65 or above, history of bleeding or clotting disorders, dangerous mechanism of injury. And um, there is also um, kind of uh, a scaffold for what is a dangerous mechanism of injury like a fall from a height is dangerous um, a pedestrian or cyclist stuck, struck by um, a zooming vehicle on the road is a dangerous um, mechanism of injury also if someone's been you know uh, flung out of a car um, after a motor vehicle accident that's a dangerous mechanism of injury okay and more than 30 minutes of retrograde amnesia of the events. Okay, so those are within eight hours. All right. So we, if there is time, um, then we can go through the true and false as well, if you guys haven't sneakily seen all the answers. Um, so the first one, can you all still see, I think you can still all see the nice guidance. So CT head within one hour, um, is that true or false? The first one. Yep, yep. All correct. Perfect. It's true. Yep. Second one. CT head within one hour. GCS less than fifteen at two hours after admission. Yep. Perfect. Third one, CT within one hour in 75 year old man who had loss of consciousness at scene, now GCS 15. False. Okay, false. Okay. All right. Does the person who said, people who said false want to explain why and the people who said true can explain why? Yeah. Yeah, so he's over 65, that puts him in the within eight hours thing. He had the loss of consciousness, but his GCS is maintaining. So um, I'm, I am worried about him, but not as worried as someone who comes in with GCS less than 13 and a post-traumatic seizure. Um, great, okay, and the last one. Okay, great. Great, it's, it's false. Again, um, this is a 55 year old female, so not quite in the um, within eight hours thing. 
um, but their GCS is 15 throughout, and uh, but they're on warfarin, so they kind of fall into the within eight hours range. Okay, perfect. I think that's all the slides. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, so there was something about which analgesics are preferred. Um, if you look up the WHO pain ladder, um, always start with paracetamol, then you can go up to NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, and then you can go on to the more um, opiate-like drugs. So always start off with, um, <clears throat> with paracetamol. Um, a fundus exam instead of CT prior to LP to check for increased ICP. Yeah, yeah. Um, a fundus exam would be um, a good alternative, but um, I feel um, like a CT is probably more sensitive. I feel, um, I'm, I'm not sure um, about the numbers behind this, um, but the, the pressure in the brain might need to get to might need to get very high. It's probably one of the last signs that you might see the uh, the papilledema um, in terms of raised intracranial pressure. So I wouldn't go for that. But you're right. You can see raised intracranial pressure um, on a fundus exam if there's papilledema. Um, yeah. So and there was another question about unequal pupils. So again, I would go through the surgical sieve. Um, in terms of what can cause unequal pupils. Um, so what are some eye syndromes that you can think of that cause um, unequal pupils? Any ideas from the audience? <laughs> Argo something, Argo Robertson, yes. Oculomotor nerve palsy, very good. Corners. Okay. All right. So you, you can also get this in, um, as I say, those are all very good um, examples. You can get them in all sorts of different, um, different syndromes of kind of bleeding within the brain with raised intracranial pressure. Um, you can also get just a stuck pupil um, with infections within the eye. You can get um, the, the iris is just stuck because of the infection and inflammation, and that can cause unequal pupils on, in one eye if there's infection in just one eye. Um, migraines can also cause unequal pupils. Um, I'm not sure what the pathophysiology is behind that. A tumour or a mass that is pressing on the I can cause it. Um, so a whole host of things can cause unequal pupils. And when you're going through your cranial nerve exams and things, it's very important to think about um, differentials for that as well. All right. I think that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to put up the feedback slide. And if anyone has any other questions at all, um, now is the time. Right. Well, um, I've put my um, Twitter onto this um, this um, PowerPoint presentation, and I'm happy for you guys to have my email, um, so you can contact me if you want any revision resources or anything like that. Um, as I said before, this is not a manual um, for anything. This this is not a go to for your neuro exams. This, these are just um, certain points that I've kind of highlighted, which helped me with my revision and my understanding of neuro. Um, and yeah, it, it's just very important to have a structure. So I'd be very grateful for some feedback um, and hopefully I can improve the session next time I do it. Okay.